this uh, talk that we're gonna do is, is it's an inspirational talk. It's based on somebody who uh, I looked up to in the game, who I've got a lot of cues from in this game. And um, you know, if you're in this room, it's because you're a part of a, of a culture. So um, you know, without further ado, let's, let's introduce Ben Ball. Let's get a round of applause. You know, one of the things people don't get to see about you, you know, people know you've been around for so long, is the wealth of knowledge you've accrued doing all of this, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people know you for the jewelry, the you know the new the new business ventures, all your celebrity connections, but people don't know your backstory as well. Um, and you you kind of persevered through a lot of a lot of things in this industry, and you've also done something a lot of people hasn't haven't been able to do, which is kind of cross genres, right? You've been in fashion, you've been in music. Um, so, you know, the first thing I want to start is just give me a little bit about your background. You know, I know one of my favorite things about you is how much you represent the Korean culture, right? You, you're a beacon for them, but you're very, very, what they would call, you know, urban, you know? Um, and I think that coming from where I come from, you know, you see this picture that's up there. <laughs> uh, that's love, kindergarten, man. Yeah, I, I love that, you, that you're in tune with who you are. You know, me being Colombian, I was raised in Brooklyn, so it was, you know, it's harder for us. It's a little bit harder coming, being outside of the box. So, you know, give me a little bit about, you know, you coming over and where you were born and kind of where you grew up. So, yeah, you know, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I was born and raised in, in, um, in Koreatown. Um, I'm the youngest out of three people, uh, three kids. Um, my brother is, uh, is almost 10 years older than me. My sister's eight years older than me. So, like, growing up in Koreatown is one thing. Back 1973, I'm old, right? So, um, my mom was like, the second or third Korean American business owner in the city of Los Angeles, wow. this is back in the day. So she came here with about $285. My brother, my dad, I think, had about $200. And this is like in the 70s. Um, my brother was born in Korea. They came here, and my parents were broke as fuck. Uh, excuse my language, if you guys, there's some kids in here. So pretty much, you know, um, my mom was so poor that when my sister was born, my dad was working, she went to the hospital, left my brother, who was like four years old in the car. You know, you can't do that now, but this course, is how yeah. it is. Left my brother in the car, and it was hot outside. And my, my mom went in there to go give birth to my sister. Wow. She had came out the hospital like maybe 15, 16 hours later, and my brother was in there, you know, just eating. Like, it was a bag of ramen, but it's like, this, you can't cook it in there, so you're just eating it like it's like, you know, like chips or something, right? Wow. And so like, you know, um, she didn't even have time to stay there when they're like, hey, you should really stay here. But we couldn't afford to stay in the hospital that long. Right. And then on top of that, we were living in a, well, but my parents were living in a garage in a city called Pomona. And no offense anybody, anybody from anybody Pomona. From Pomona? <laughs> Any Pomonians? Is Pomona is still a kind, yeah, yeah, of, yeah. kind of a fucked up area. I've you know been there, I mean? yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's not like they ain't nothing, <laughs> ain't nothing lit over there, you know? I mean, the people are cool. So, you know, when I kind of became, when I was born, um, we had moved more into the city. And Koreatown was like a small area. Mm. And you know, Koreatown was mostly Mexicans, it was mostly Latinos. Um, there was some Korean people there, even though a lot of Korean businesses were there, Korean people didn't live there. Okay. So it was a lot of gang shooting, you know, all kinds of things. And so you grew um, up right in the thick of all that energy. Yeah, all the, like how, five different major gangs and stuff. How did, you, how did your parents uh, create a business? You said they were business owners. So they weren't business owners, so my, my, my dad was studying to go to school. Okay. And my mom, she had a, a sewing machine business inside of the garage, a little place, a little shack that we lived in, or they lived in, in Pomona. Right. And eventually, she had two machines, and she had three machines, and she had five machines. And the crazy story about this whole shit is, my mom put the sewing machine in the hand of the people from Forever 21, this multi-billion dollar company. What? My mom put the sewing machine in the people that are making lucky jeans and true religion. And my mom was working at a company, there was this company called Cherokee. I think they're still around, they got a Target and shit. Yeah. Well, my mom was contracting dresses and she started just, she was hustling. And at a certain point, you know, she had an entire factory. So, you know, um, I was born into, you know, I mean, I basically grew up. Entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, I mean, you know, my mom was a hustler. She had no, not necessarily talent, she just had hard work. Back then, hard work would get you there. Right. Now you kind of got to be smart, right. you feel me? Or, or, have so, a, or have a good networking yeah. system. Yeah, so you know, she, she was a dress contractor, you know, in downtown LA, and it was fucked up over there. The, um, back in the day, the, uh, the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez was around. It was, a real, it was crazy wow. going on there. So, you know, my mom, um, she just worked real hard to put everything. So education was big in Korean families. Right. And I hated education. Okay. And on top of that, my dad was a pastor in a church, and I hated church. Right. So like having to go to church like every single week, you know, I would make up excuses to be sick, like, oh, God, make you feel better. I'm like, nah, man, you're tripping, you know, like, 
<laughs> so you know, God will make you feel better. So let me let me fast forward a bit. You know, you grew up in a, a rough area. It was kind of mixed. A lot of gang stuff going on in that era out, out here on the West Coast. You know, you, a lot of people don't know you were a hip hop executive. Yeah. So what was your transition and influence to get into hip hop? Was that the first thing that you were interested in that you kind of like delved into as a business? I mean, let's go even further before that. So there was the first major hip hop club. And I think, I'm not mistaken, 1983 okay. was the year it opened. So in 83, I was 10 years old. I was sneaking into this place. It was called a Radiotron. And um, I was sneaking into this place. You were able to be, I think, 15 or something. But you know, it was, it was like to get kids off the street and break dance. I went in there and I met Ice-T. What? And Ice-T was rapping like, rapping like, you know, he was like a pimp too. And I idolized this dude because, you know, growing up, you see him. Like, people on the street, you're thinking, and this is before, there's no social media. This ain't... Ice-T wasn't on TV like that, you know right. what I mean? He was, there was Ray, no law and order. Rick Ross was not on TV, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Rick Ross, I mean, that's funny because you think about it, I mean, I'm talking to Ice-T right now, I'm doing a TV show right now with Ice-T, and he's like, anyone that's 21 years old, at one year's age, all you know me as a cop. Right, right. You know what I mean? So he like, going been, then, this dude, is a, this dude is a real G. Yeah, of course. Freeway Rick Ross, the real Rick Ross, bro had Benzes and Ferraris, and this is like, you know, I'm looking at this like, you know, we have a fucked up Volvo. And I'm like, man, one day, you know, I got to get this life. So, you know, I'm seeing these people on the street. I get to meet Ice. I'm breakdancing, and I'm into, like, this whole thing. And I win a contest there. From there, me and Ice became cool. He kind of became my godfather. Okay. But it was a lot of gang shit going on, whatever. I always got into music. My brother was into Parliament, Funkadelic, James Brown, and all the old shit, right. Earth, Wind, and Fire. And then breakdancing came around. Do you and still that's know I'm how to breakdance? I mean, I could pop a little. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I was big into it. And um, there wasn't really a hip hop radio station. I mean, K-Day wasn't around then. Okay. It was alternative station, and they had this contest, and it said, "Hey, man, come to the um, Santa Anita Mall." And of all people, it was like this this women's shoe store called Nine West. Yeah. And they had this contest with K-Rock, this dude named Poor Man. And I went out there, and it was a bunch of people coming out there, whatever. And you know, I don't really have anything to go by except watching movies. Right. So this is like '84, maybe, and I won the contest. Wow. You know, so my thing was I wanted to do at my age, I was doing a lot of shit independent. Kids now, you won't even see a person have their kids out that are 13 right. out in the street. Right, right, right. Let alone at 12, I flew to New York to go meet Rock Steady Crew and all the breakdancers from Beach Street because so, that was like my dream. So that was the prize to win this contest? You, you got the contest? Go to New York. Got it, went to New York. And then breakdance, whatever, wow. blah, blah. You know, back then the style was the Sway Pumas, the, the Nike Windbreakers, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? The Adidas, obviously the, the warm ups that are still popular now. And so I was always into shoes fashion then, but music was always something big. I never wanted to be an actor or nothing. I just knew I wanted to fuck with music. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so how, how did it get from the dancing to the actual music? What was your first job in music? Well, I mean, technically a dude, by the way, his name is Rob One. He's a pioneer, LA hip hop pioneer. We had started a graffiti crew. Okay. And um, that graffiti crew became something else and then became big. Okay. And he put the turntables in my hands. This is around, <laughs> Uh, 1985. Okay. So 1985, I started getting turntables in my hands. I started learning how to mix and DJ stuff. And then um, another dude by the name of DJ Lethal, he was in a group called Limp Biscuit and House of Pain. Wow, yeah. Gigantic bands. So I wonder, I wonder how many of you guys remember some of these bands. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You were House of Pain? There you go. Jump around. Limp Biscuit. Limp Biscuit sure. was big. My, yeah, my Fred Durst hat. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so Lethal was the producer and the DJ. Yeah, of the group. course. Yeah. So you know, from there, I was DJing, and there was a couple things that were going on. So I think my first real DJ gig. And my boy's in here somewhere, who, uh, Terry is in here somewhere. Big Terry Heller, what's going on, man? Terry is a legend. Um, his uncle is Jerry Heller, NWA, Ruthless Records, a whole yeah, let's give, let's give the whole Yeah, let's give him a And uh, I'll be honest with you, Terry is a very in big inspiration to me because I grew up around Jews and blacks all my life. The Korean thing was a little weird because Koreans weren't listening to hip hop. They were listening to some shit. I couldn't even <laughs> tell you what it was. It was some, you know, it wasn't G-Dragon. No, hell no. You know what I mean? So it was like just some other shit. So, you know, um, I, was, I was very, you know, attracted to, to the Jewish community with the, how, how they were shrewd with money and, and business and everything else. And then obviously, I mean, it was done, but like Latinos and blacks around me. Right. Spanish was my first language before us. Korean was my second. English was my third language growing up. And so, you know, anyways, going on, uh, me and Terry used to go to this club called Ballistics. And Ballistics was my first DJ job. Another dude that was DJing there was, was Paul Stewart. Paul Stewart was the vice president, later on became the vice president of Def Jam. He created um, Coolio, uh, 
Montel Jordan is how we do it. In fact, Montel Jordan on that song mentions him. Um, it's actually one of my South favorite. Central Cartel, just a bunch of stuff. Like you hear the song, he says, there was a DJ and the Paul was his name, and that's Paul. So he ended up working with Ice Cube, and just a lot of legends came out of that one little spot. And you were DJing there? I was DJing there with Rob One. Okay. I was co DJ. Okay. One of my best friends was running the club, and Dave Faustino, he's Bud Bundy from Married with Children, yes. he was the co owner of the club. Okay. So we're doing this, Terry's there, whatever. Terry's uncle's obviously a major player. We have Easy E coming into the club. Okay. Like, this place is heavy right now. Why, why did not even bother straight out of Compton? He wasn't in it. Didn't get a cameo? He's actually a lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so going on, um, every Friday night there'd be a battle. And it would be this dude named Will 1X, and it would be this dude X to the Z. Later on, he'd be Exhibit. Wow. And this is like, I think Exhibit was maybe 16 at the time, whatever. Wow, that's crazy. And then Will 1X is actually Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> So you're telling me you DJ at a club where Will I Am and Exhibit used to battle each other? Am I lying? <laughs> so they would battle each other, and on top of that, Tory Spelling would wait and like it was crazy because this is wild. it was like not like it wasn't like a bunch of thug dudes. It would like be a bunch of hip hop people, and then like a bunch of like white Beverly Hills girls there. So basically, this club was the first Instagram. It was the, the shit. It was incredible. Pretty good. Brian Austin Green from 90210 used to go there. Blah blah. So I started. That was my first gig. The thing is, I had to go to school. Okay. Remember, I had a really strict Korean dad. My mom was whooping ass. We got, you know, it was different. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I had so, a hard time, like, you know. So you were DJing? I was DJing. And, and I had, going to school? No, I, so I ended up going to school on a scholarship. So I was gone for a little bit. But the crazy part was, if I could, I would drive from San Francisco to LA almost every single weekend to just to get into whatever okay. it may be. Okay. Because then there were other clubs called The Good Life where Farside came out of. Um, there was a hip hop room. There was there was a bunch of things that came out and spawned out of that. And um, so you just mentioned you got a scholarship. A lot of people don't know you actually play sports. Yeah. So, so in high school, I was uh, I was I went to Fairfax, went to Beverly Hills High School. I, I made all city, all conference, all state. Didn't make all American. And um, you know what sport? Football and basketball. Okay. So you know um, you know you deal a lot of racism. First of all, I'm in hip hop, and there's nobody even white in hip hop. You gotta remember how unaccepted this was. Right. There was. It was blacks and that was it. You know what I'm saying? Like there was some there were some Puerto Ricans and Latino, but they're not really Puerto Ricans in LA. You know, that's more like your area. Right, right, right. Or Dominicans so, and Colombians and stuff. Right. So um playing ball, that was another thing. Playing ball, I got to meet people. You know, a lot of these guys are a lot older now, you know what I mean? That, that I played against Jason Kidd, you know, I played against Harold Miner's not around, uh, Curtis Conway, um, a couple cats, you right. know. So you go to you go to school, let's fast forward. First job in the record industry, aside from DJing, okay, so, you were a music executive, yeah. which is kind of where our paths link up a bit, right? Because right. you know I'm a Rock Nation representative. I come from that from that tree, and you're also very, very close, very integral in the original Rockefeller family. So part of the original Rock, yeah. Right. So give me a little background about uh, how you transitioned from DJing, and when 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 was your first corporate, I guess, record position? Okay. Well, real quick, there was a kid at my school. See, Beverly Hills High School, my dad put me there. We lived in a 600 square foot bedroom. Uh, 600 square foot single apartment, so there's no bedroom. Right. It was like, you know, like the wall with the bed. And uh, just so I can go to school in that district. Right. When I went there, I hated it because I was like, yo, man, I want to go back to the hood. I want to go back to Koreatown. Like, I don't like these rich kids. This is like, this ain't for me. It was embarrassing. Right. You know, I take the bus and whatever. And these kids are pulling up in Porsches. And um, one of the kids in my class, his name is James Purse. He has a very successful clothing brand. You guys might have heard of that, right? Yeah. So James Purse would be in my class, and then like Monica Lewinsky, who sucked the president's beat <laughs> up, you know what? Like, she was in my class. There was a bunch of people in my class. Lenny Kravitz went to my people school. People were influential in history. Big time. So there was a girl named Pilar DeMann. Her dad is Freddie DeMann. He was Madonna's manager. Okay. So this dude in my, my school, he was actually down with Ice-T, these people. He was like, he was a Jewish cat, but he was real like, he was real slippery and, you know, he had scams. He was always selling fake IDs and things. And <laughs> I took a liking to do. Right. And um, his name is Guy Siri. And Guy is a fucking enormous person in the music business. Okay. And he told me, he said, Ben, don't go to school. You're tripping. I'm about to start this record label. And, and you know, we're 18, bro. He's like, I'm about to start this record label. I'm about to get a job in Madonna. I'm telling you, tell your dad, run away. <laughs> and I was like, I can't, dude. Like, you know what I mean? My, yeah, my, like, my dad will still try to knock me, you know, but I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, of course. So going on, I went to school. He started this record label under Maverick with, with, with Madonna. Okay. You know, he has his first rap group, it doesn't do well. And low key, I'm hating, I'm like, yo, cool, you know what I mean? I want him to, go, to do well. And so after I finish school, towards the end, I come back to LA, hook up with my boys from Ballistic. I'm on Melrose, I see Denzel Washington on the street in front of 40 Acres and Mule, Spike Lee's store. Yeah. 
And I see Denzel getting out of Porsche, and I gave him my mixtape. I was like, hey, listen, I heard you opening up a restaurant. So you were, you were pushing the mixtape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, but this is what mixtapes were real mixtapes. Where actually songs book. blended. Yeah. It wasn't like dudes was trying to, like, like yeah. people say mixtapes are an album now. Yeah, you didn't have a SoundCloud link to say yeah. yeah, there's no SoundCloud, nothing like that. And the crazy part was, um, I knew Denzel Washington listened to hip hop. Yeah. And he goes, what do you want me to do with this? Okay. And I was like, you're opening a, a bar that's going to serve food and have um, clients there. Yeah. Just Denzel was. Yeah. Okay. He was one of the owners. And I said, all you have to do is listen to this. And if it's whack, I will DJ for the entire year for free. And at that time, I was getting $100 a night. Me and DJ Homicide were eating AMPM. Like, we were just doing, we were couch surfing, we were broke. Right. You know? So, so a week later, Denzel's assistant calls me. She goes, you start booming this first night. First night I'm doing a part, the uh, first night I DJ, Queen Latifah walks in and she's having a party there. <laughs> and she fucks with the music. And I'm yeah. like, yo, just let me handle the music. And I got it. There's half of the owners are white too, though. And they also rock shit. Like, so you had to play some of that. Yeah, so it was like a weird transition vibe, whatever. But Dr. Dre and Suge Knight start coming there a lot. Okay. And you would see Suge walk through the door because he was a fucking big dude. Plus back then he was like, Really Debo, people were scared right. of this dude, right? So like, I didn't really want to talk to Suge too much, you know, but I idolized Dre. You know, I used yeah, to go to the concerts and seeing him. So one night, all the white owners weren't at the club. Okay. And it was a night that Jada Pinkett was having her birthday party there. And I was the DJ, so they can't hire a DJ, so I was there. And Jada Pinkett listened to house music. Okay. So she had some house dude come there. And we kind of punked this dude, like, yo, listen, you're going to get 20 minutes. And after that, if you say anything to Jay, we're going to fuck you. <laughs> so we start playing music, and I see Dre gets there early. Who gets to a club bar at, like, 10 o'clock? Right. Well, regular, so I set, regular people. Yeah. So I set the tone. I put all black exploitation films on the TVs and everything, right? And I start playing. I start at 70s funk, 80s. Then we in the 90s, so I get into it. And I go downstairs, go because the DJ was at the booth. I go downstairs. I sit next to Dre on purpose. And I just act like I'm going to order a drink. Uh -huh. And Dre goes... Yo, youngster, what the fuck you know about all that music, man? What's yeah. going on? And I was like, oh, you know, it's nothing. I just, I just, my brother, you know, pulled me up on gang. He's like, right. okay. At the time, Dre had an artist named Sam Sneed, who was like their main producer, cool. main artist. Sam was coming to the club a lot too, and he said, give me your phone number. So I gave him my pager number. Your pager? Yeah, that's what I had. You guys know what that is? <laughs> so you know how to pager, and, and you know, so um, this was the time where like, you know, boom. And so I was driving my boy, who was working at Def Jam too. Okay. And I said, I got a page, can I borrow your phone? So he gives me the brick phone. He gives you, know? you like a big... Yeah. So I called the phone, and he goes, Can-Am Studios. And he's like, that's Dr. Dre, homeboy. And I was like, oh shit. He goes, hey man, bring a crate of your best breaks and come to the studio tonight. And when, like, when was this, more or less? This was about 94, 95. Okay, so it's like right in the... Thick. I just finished school and everything, you know right. what I'm saying? So I'm in, I'm DJing, I'm doing that, boom. So I get in, I go to Can-Am. And um, in the main studio, Daz, Corrupt, and all them, Dog Pound and Snooper in there, there's literally, I'm not bullshitting you, there might be 25 fuck. There's never a reason for more than four people in the studio. Right. There's like 25 people, there's pit bulls in there, yeah. and there's girls half naked. That sound, that sounds like a good studio yeah. session. Man. <laughs> then there's one session with this dude named Stooby Doo and someone else, and then Dre had his quiet studio. Okay. And Sam. Snoopy Doo? So, Scooby Doo. Stooby Doo. Oh, his okay. name was Stuart. And then did that turn into Snoop Dogg or? No, no, Stuart, uh, he ended up being a, a Dre producer later, oh, okay, but I think okay, he okay. sells cars now, I don't know. <laughs> so I go in the studio, we start working, blah, blah, whatever. And um, we just, we start vibing. Right. And he's like, hey man, um, I need to talk to you. And Dre says, uh, I don't know if I can put you here right now at death row. Right. Um, and I don't understand why. Okay. But he said, but I can get you a job with somebody. You knew it was a volatile situation. I, did, I, did, I didn't know, honestly. Okay. Because it was really, there's no social media. Who, there's no rumors. Well, tonight. I mean, you walk into a room and you see pit bulls and strippers and 40 guys. But what I'm saying record, is, it's not yeah. a regular record label. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, so Dre says, um, I can connect you with somebody. I'm going to connect you with somebody. So he connects me with his old CEO, Brian Turner. Brian Turner was the CEO of Priority Records. He signed NWA, Dr. Dre's first album. For, for the people that don't know, Priority Records was the first label that gave Rockefeller distribution. So Rockefeller Records was an independent label that looked that needed distribution and that nobody would sign them. Obviously, you guys know Jay is independent, has been independent forever, and always has partnered with companies, and Priority was the first to give him a distribution deal. Yeah. So I'll meet with Brian, and Brian goes, uh, all right, man, you know, you know about music and stuff? Uh, Dre's a pretty big co-sign, so I'm gonna right. give you a job as a manager. So A&R manager is like, it goes A&R manager, then you go A&R, A&R director, 
So and just to clarify what A and R does. For A and R means artist and repertoire. So pretty much A and R is someone that's gonna mold someone from the beginning. I see somebody right here, he's rapping, and I'm like, all right, you know, you got some dope. Yeah, I can fuck with you. Check this out though. Listen, uh, I'm gonna get you with the producer. Let's get in the studio. Let's hear the vibe. Plus, I, I want to try to get a whole artist and repertoire direction on how you dress and how everything goes. And basically, I'm not like really a manager. I'm really the person that's gonna mold you. To put before you put this album out. Then when your second album comes out, I go oversee that as well and everything else. But so also these guys also pick beats, yeah. put them with producers. These guys are kind of like coaches, right? Yeah, but I was a manager, so there was like three dudes above me and they would shit on me all day like, yo, listen to this. And there was like a 200 gallon, like 200 gallon trash can with demo tapes, tapes in there. Right, tapes. And one of the tapes I pulled out, I bullshit you not, dude. Every one of these guys looked like fucking John Goodman with beard. They look like this. I, they, they weren't even. It wasn't even rap. I was right. like, yo, and rap wasn't as big then. You know, what right, I mean? right, there right. might have been 300 rappers in the world at that time. Right. Well, Priority didn't have any yeah. hip hop acts. But I'm talking about in general. There's maybe nine billion rappers now. Okay. Right. So basically, I start figuring out, and this is what's important to you guys to understand. When you're in a situation where people have more knowledge than you. They got seniority over you, they're hating on you, and you're in jeopardy of losing your job every single day. I learned real quick. I said, Dre, what do I do? He said, shut the fuck up, pay attention where the money is, soak up every bit of knowledge. If you gotta steal, you gotta do whatever. Not like literally, you know, but yeah, if means you gotta be, be, be yeah. cunning. So pretty much, I was a sneaky motherfucker. Okay. You know, I would sit in the meetings because I'm the manager, so I got to basically be with the uh, A and R above me, who's right. the real dude signing the deals. And I'd sit there and listen to what he's talking about. I'm like, you know, man, you corny. Like in my brain, I'm like, you're fucking corny, bro. Like, yeah. you know, well, a, lot, a lot of people in the industry yeah. at that time, position of power, they didn't understand you know, the culture. They didn't understand the culture. And and then this one dude, like, he listened to like he just was so. I'm mean, not. I love '80s. That's like my shit. I still listen to '80s. But he was like, I was like, bro, you don't even know rap. Like, how'd you get this job, bro? Right. And I'm just sitting there thinking, all right, well, then I'm listening to some of the ideas he had about, like, marketing and certain things and beats. And I'm like, yo, you're fucking, this guy's terrible. So I immediately soaked up everything he had to say that was good. And I said, I'm going to turn it on him. And no, it's terrible, but there's really no other way to do it. You have to kind of, like, because, like, if you're playing basketball and someone gives you the ball and you're sitting there looking for a shot, well, what the fuck are you doing, man? If you're open, shoot the ball. Don't even think about it. Just shoot. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, by the way, he's a Lakers fan, so. <laughs> but what I'm saying is some people are sitting that, there too long and they're mentality. thinking. Why would you think you have the ball in your hands? Take the fucking destiny, man. You know, you miss. All right, well, fuck it. At least you shot your shot. You know, whatever it may be. So, you know. Um, you took his approach. You kind of remixed it. Let's just say in two years, I was able to fuck everyone above me up and have all their meetings fucked up and everything fucked up and until I got my chance. So, guys. Fuck your bosses up. <laughs> and have a chance. Pretty much. So what? What? How what, did the rock? How did the that's rock? That's what I'm getting right now. So what happened was pretty much at a certain point. All my life, at this time, I'm the youngest. See, people are doing things big at 18, 19. It was not really that that type of world back then. A and R's were 38. Right. That's why Wu Tang said, "Who's your A and R?" You know, a mountain climber that plays an electric guitar. That was deep. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, like right. there wasn't no hip hop then. Right. You know, I have this. Fucking, I'm sweating hip hop, it's in my blood veins. Right. So all my life, been arrested three times before I turned 18, you know, I don't fucking listen, I don't fuck with authority, you know, I did, always did great on my tasks, my SATs, everything, homework, I was just never really that dude for school, it wasn't for me at all whatsoever, and I knew that, you know, I got my degree in cinematography, you know what I'm saying? I was a, I was a fucking PA, if anybody here has been a, been a PA before, been a production assistant, I built a house. Dog, I built a house. You know what I'm talking about? I really built a fucking house. Like, I'm like, what does this guy do with movies? Right. And like, you know, like I was an assistant to Tia Carrera. She's the girl from Wayne's World, the Asian yeah, girl. Yeah. Like, dog, she sent me to her house to go get two aqua contact lenses. And I brought back some like blue ones, and she's like, nah, this ain't aqua. I'm like, man, for real? Like, that was the kind of shit that I would do. And I was like, listen, at a certain point, enough is enough. Like, I'm not hustling so that I can go get this Mercedes Benz so far yet. I'm hustling so I don't have to take any orders from anybody else. I'm hustling because I want to change the game. I'm hustling and doing it. I'm doing everything as, with, as strategic as I can so that nobody else 
even law or whatever can tell me what to do. Okay. And if you go from back then to now, I see some of these same people. I'm the same dude. Nothing has changed me. Right. The money has never changed me. It's changed the people around me. Right. Okay. And I go there. I'm like, yo, listen, bro. I will still eat spam and rice, man. I don't give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? I'll go to Wiener Sitz so if my stomach I like can take spam and it. Rice. But you know, like, I'm not tripping on that. It's just that these people now that were like, man, fuck Ben Yang, man, fuck Ben Baller. You know, they're like, oh man, dog, that shit was dope. Sometimes I know it's dope. Right. Sometimes I know I telephoned a piece in. Right. And they're still jocking that. I'm like, all right, you know, cool, whatever. It is what it is. So the Rockefeller. Going back into it, I was able to get these dudes that are now basically had signed three groups because I said, yo, those groups, those groups are dope. Okay. Now, mind you, I cost my boss money for them signing these groups. Which groups were these? Just random groups you're saying? Yeah, I feel bad saying I'm just No, nah, let's not say them. You said random groups didn't they're, they're, they're rappers that had albums out though. Okay. And I said, you should sign these. Okay. And then my boy, there was a really big song called Freak, Freak Like Me? Or Adina Howard. Okay. I want a freak in the morning. What the fuck? It was an enormous song. Okay. She sold like five platinum. He had a chance to sign her. Okay. And I said, bro, you're going to sign her? I was like, you tripping. I got so deep in his head, he didn't sign her. She got signed to Atlantic, went five times platinum. So you took, you took two hours back to back. Yeah, yeah. And then, he, and then he did other things. And then the other guy was already on his way out because he was, you know, like I said, he was like, he was like fucking like Seth Rogen. He was like, he was a clown, bro. I was, I was like, man, dude, you don't know about hip hop. Then. No, nothing against Seth Rogen. <laughs> the, Freeze, the Freeze Records deal came in. Okay. And we had the first top, first check said, hey, Ben, listen to this. And don't tell anybody you had this. The album was damn near done. Which album? Reasonable Doubt. Wow. And I said, and I said, yo, man, let me listen to this album. Now, at the time, I'm a huge Biggie fan. Okay. You know, Ready to Die was crazy. Right. And I hear Brooklyn's Finest. And I just, all I had to hear was one thing. He said, like, short sleeve, I bear arms. And I heard that, and then right. Biggie's going back and forth. I was like, yo, listen. This, this is done. This, this is, is we, crazy. We got to sign this. Right. And he goes, all right, well, it's going to go through a P and D. It's going to do, which is a press and distribute deal. We're yeah. going to do this, blah, blah, whatever. And um, basically, I stayed very close to that project. Okay. So I meet Damon Dash. I meet Biggs. I meet everybody. I got so damn deep into this project that my boss said, hey, man, do you work for Priority or do you work for Rockefeller Records? Right. And what'd you say? And I was like, I work for Priority, man. Come on, man. You know what's up. But in your heart. You were rock. I was pretty rock, man. Me right. and Biggs got really close. Me and Dame got really close. Me and Jay were not really close. Right. Now the thing about it was, I didn't think Jay was gonna be huge. A lot I of thought, people did it. I thought that this was gonna be my project. Right. In. So you you helped develop the Rockefeller system. That was like your real first arrival in the music industry. On the second single, first single was was uh. Can first I single, no. First single was ain't no. And then the B-side was, um, I'm sorry, first single was Dead Presidents, the B-side was Ain't No. B-side, so if you guys know how the, the records, because these are actual records, right, albums. They used to make the, the music on vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> vinyl. So the A-side is usually your big song. B-side is not the big song. A, A, the A-side was, was uh, Dead Presidents, B-side was Ain't No with Foxy Brown. The B-side ended up being the gigantic smash hit. By the time we're about to go into the second single with Mary J. Blige, they promoted me to vice president of the company. They knew okay. immediately. So now I'm above the dudes. Those two dudes that, that so I So now I, you're, you actually got the position you wanted. Yeah, and I have 26 people under me. Now the crazy part was we had just signed Master P. And I had just, Master P, I was Keith Murray at Red Band's tour DJ. Okay. So this is like an insane honor. So you're doing a bunch of different things in music. Yeah. So let me I'm trying fast, to get my ditty on. Let me, let me fast forward a bit. So you got a bunch of success in the music industry. You're, you're a &R and you're vice president, you're DJing, you got respect on high levels. East Coast music, which is obviously kind of blossoming out here. Yeah. You're a West, you're a West Coast guy, getting bi-coastal. One of the things that, have to, that we have to touch on is like, how did that transition into you getting into the fashion of it? You, were you always into sneakers? Because that's something that kind of has transitioned for you to be a lifestyle icon. When did that start? Was that from the beginning when you were wearing Shell toes and this is from way back. I had I can I can remember the first day I got my Sky Forces. If you have Air Force Ones, if you're under a size six and a half, the kid shoe was a Sky Force. Okay. So that was like eighty one or eighty two up eighty two I think yeah eighty two was an Air Force One. I had the Sky Forces. I played basketball in those. Okay. And then eighty five. I remember I was just big enough to get an Air Jordan. If you had the exact same shoe at six size six, it'd be a Sky Jordan. But the shoe is exactly the same. Okay. So I was in the sneakers always for that and everything. In fact, when I was in the music business, my first year there, when I was still a manager, 
I would see Nike gifting all these celebrities, uh, artists, shoes. Right. And um, Outkast just came out. Okay. So Andre 3000, big boy. And they had these shoes. They were the Air Turf Deion Sanders shoes. Love those. And I was like, I need these shoes. Like, I need these. You know, yeah. So I've always been that dude. And um, I forgot to mention, I was working with Missy Elliott. She was doing a lot of writing for me. She wasn't even signed yet. Yeah. She was just, she had a group that she was signed under, under um, Teddy Riley and Jodeci. It was called Sista. But she wasn't even huge yet. And I was trying to get her signed. We okay. didn't have the money for her. And they didn't believe that she was going to be enormous. And later, yeah, she became fucking huge. Huge. So going on... Um, I've always been in sneakers, right? And it was a couple of dudes that were in their heads that were in the sneakers. Dante Ross was in the sneakers, um, Clark Kent was in the sneakers, and Clark Kent was a producer on Reasonable Doubt, you right. know. So we were, you know, I always kept that in there. So was that one of your ne like networking capabilities that you connected with other people who had lifestyle extensions in the music industry? Like Clark Kent, like did you guys ever say, okay, well, you know, this is something, this is where it's going. This is kind of like the next step of where this is going. See, another thing too is it was a hobby. I never looked at it because back then you weren't really flipping shoes, you know what I'm right. saying? But again, just like sneakers today is haters. Right. So not a lot of us are really cool. Like back then you can see, oh damn, the Air Jordan 3s came out? All right, let's go to Foot Locker and go get them. You can go to the store and legitimately get them. Right. Because people in their brain were like, yo, you're really gonna drop $100 on a pair of sneakers? Right. That was not, like they couldn't fathom that, you know? Right. But I was like, I don't give a fuck. You know? So you started, you started collecting then from then. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of my entrepreneurial advice was, you know, Dr. Dre gave my first big check. And Dr. Dre gave me a check and it was like, our company was very small. Aftermath was like, 13 people, okay. and there was like six producers. And F, so 13 people, 12 people are black, and I'm the only Korean, or only Asian. So in the studio every day, you already know, it was Bruce Lee jokes and everything. And I gotta shoot the racist jokes back because if I don't, I'm not gonna survive in there. Right. So you know, Dre pulls me to the side all the time. I'm like, why you always pull me to the side? He goes, because you my, you, you the golden child. Remember that movie there? He's like, you the golden child, bro. And he's like, yo, I have a question for you. First day I signed on, he bought every guy in their expedition and every girl got to explore. Okay. And then he gave everyone, you know, the check. And I was like, yo, I'm about to go to Sporty LA. I'm about to get mad kicks. And I'm about to go get a Rolex. I'm about to go get a BMW. <laughs> and the first thing he says to me, he says, what are you going to do with your money? I'm like, why are you asking me? Why don't you ask them? He goes, because they're dumbasses. And I expect them to be, it was, it was real racist in a way, reverse racism to his own people. And he was like, I don't want you to be an N-word. And I was like, but I, but I am an N-word because I'm, I'm here with them. It's my boys, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's like, man, stop, stop. He's like, Ben, it's easy to make a million dollars in this business if you hot like you. It's real hard to keep a million dollars, though. It's really hard. It's a gem. So it's stuck in my head. And of course, the next day, I bought a Rolex and a BMW, you know what I mean? And I came to the, I came to the studio, and I remember I blocked Dr. Dre's space, and uh, he was like, yo, whose car is that? He said, oh, it's Ben Yang's. He was like... He so didn't that, speak to so, me for like the rest of the week. So that, that, was, that was the end of his music career. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty so, much with Dre, you know. So, so let's fast forward a bit. Um, let's get into something that everybody here obviously knows, knows you for, the world knows you for, and kind of where me and you started connecting a little bit more, the jewelry business. This is a very, very different business. The jewelry business is something that is very hard to one, break into, two, understand, three, market, because it's a luxury item. It's a, lug it's a high price point thing. So it's a 1% of the world. And you've been able to do something in the jewelry industry that most people have, which is kind of create a taste level. Your customer base, your clients, your connections, your pieces, you turn people down. Yeah. No jeweler turns people down. So how did you, what was the first thing? Because this is a family thing. You know, I know, I know. So people get, hand. there's a lot of specifics that we get into real quick. So leaving the record business, one of the things was one, the music business got me so disgusted I can't imagine it now, let alone then. I was so sick of it. And there was a DJ crew between me, DJ M, and DJ Homicide. We were also a sneaker crew. Of course. They were still DJing. Homicide was killing it with Sugar Ray. He has fucking millions of records sold. He has the first mansion. And this dude was actually sharing, because we were broke together. So, you right. know, he was like, yo, man, you know why I always ask you why we should eat? And I was like, why? He goes, because we were always broke, man. And so I, I want to make sure we eat. Yeah. AM was fat, killing it. And then he became skinny AM. Dating Nicole Richie, got engaged, TMZ, the whole nine. And we Top kinda, sneaker like, collector. Yeah, so all world. of us, yeah, all of us kind of came up in, on Nike Talk, and that's when the real culture came through, and this is what started jewelry. The whole thing. I was engaged for the first time in my life, and I thought my life was about to change, about to get married, blah blah, but I became like a real fucking because you know I never had anything before my right. life. When you're in the music business and you make one hundred twenty-five thousand, two hundred thousand dollars as an executive vice president. You, you, you make, let's say you make 200 grand, 
Okay, after taxes you get about 110, 115,000. Okay, so let's say I had 115,000. I spent 200 grand, so I was in the whole 85,000 each year because I had to have the Versace shirt. I had to have this you know, same Versace shirt. You know what I'm saying? By the but, way, this this shirt. I, I, when we were in the back, I was looking at it. This shirt has a pretty interesting story. This is a this is a very vintage shirt. So yeah, I'll, I'll turn it into this story right here. <laughs> I was basically exp we had an expense account, so you know. When I got my first expense account, I was like, all right, I'm going to take someone to Cheesecake Factory. You know, that's like, oh, hey, who, who you take? Oh, I took Faith Evans and my group to Faith the Cheesecake Factory. All right. If you don't have a celebrity or someone of importance in your expense report, they're going to decline your meal. Right. So you were, you were fake having dinners with yeah. everybody. I was fake having dinners with a lot of people. Me yeah. and Terry might have had a meal, you know, whatever. So at a certain point, you know, I was like, yo, listen, I saw Tupac and them wearing Versace. Right. And we're going to this convention called How Can I Be Down? This is like, you know, this is towards the end of everything. And I was like... Yo, man, like, is Versace expensive? Like, you know, I know shit's fresh, like, you know, whatever. So Gianni Versace was still alive, then he was having parties at his house. And uh, so I walked into a store in Ball Harbor, and, and I saw the shirt. I was like, yo, I want to get this shirt. And it was 800-something dollars. That's like $5,000 now, you know what I mean? I was like, um, yeah, so the Versateller, like, Versateller is an ATM card back then, because there wasn't really, like, a lot of ATM machines back then, like there is now. No Apple Pay. Yeah, no one Apple Pay. So, you know, I bought the shirt. And this is probably the, one of the only things I've ever kept 21 years. There's 21 years I've had this shirt. Man, that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty wavy and cultural right there. So, you know, I, I was always, always never saving money. Right. And it, and it, wasn't, until, uh, it wasn't until I got to that point where I was getting engaged and everything else. I didn't want to be in the music business anymore. I had to figure out a way to what. So basically what I was doing was I was flipping sneakers to make rent to do what else right. but more so i was flipping sneakers to buy more sneakers right. you know i had an obsession nobody here does that right and nobody here buys sneakers. early on if you see something and it could be anything it doesn't apply just to sneakers it could be pokemon it could be t-shirts it could be supreme it could be anything you gotta remember a lot of these companies weren't even around then i was lucky to be around all these people but i just saw something and i saw a chance there was a sneaker called the nike sb dunk and sb dunk hadn't come out yet and I had word from a few people, because I had a skate background, that these sneakers were only releasing at skate shops, and I knew all the skate shops in LA. Now, the typical fucking sneakerhead is not going to a skate shop. Right. So pretty much, I had got about three people who had higher credit card limits, and we cleaned out, <laughs> we cleaned out from all the way from San Francisco all the way to San Diego. All the SBs. 40% of the entire stock of all SBs in the world. Wow. And then I posted on Nike Talk, and I was the first person to put stockroom pics. It looked like a stockroom. So I posted a picture, and people were like, yo, what the fuck, is that a store? And I was like, no, nah, man. And they're like, yo, man, sell me a pair. Stop being like that. I was like, I ain't selling you shit. <laughs> so pretty much at that point, I controlled a majority of all the inventory in the world. And it so wasn't basically, like basically you were the first hype beast. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. So these shoes were 60 bucks. Right. Right? And I said, I'm gonna hold on for them for a while. And then people were like, yo, I don't know if you should hold on to it, you know, you don't know. And then people start like people start seeing like the New York. was one of the biggest ones. It was Danny Supa, it was the Supas. Okay. They, were, they were the New York Knicks colors. Yeah, of course. So New Yorkers were like, yo, Supas move. And you know they were comfortable, they had extra cushion. So I started seeing them sell for 250. My boy's like, yeah, that's 400% you know, profit. I was like, no, nah, man, they're going to go up. And then they went up to like four or 500. Right. And I said, all right, fuck this. I dumped all my pairs. And a part of it was I was smart. I dumped about 15% of my stock here in, in America. The rest went to Japan. Okay. That way, it makes it even more difficult for people here to buy them and rise the price up. Right. Anyways, going on, um, I started working with Nike. I got real sick of Nike in the corporate world and that, all that. Because again, even though I was kind of doing well, they're a multi-billion dollar company, and they were telling me how I should dress. I couldn't wear polo to the office anymore. Polo's technically a competitor to Nike. It was just all kinds yeah, of shit. Of we don't say the word party, Ben Yang. We yeah. say the word event. And I was like, yeah. man, fuck out of here. Like, I can't have this. <laughs> so at that point, I put a bad taste in my mouth. I was doing a collaboration with them. We were doing a Terminator shoe. And I just got into a real bad fight, and I just felt like, you know what, a lot was going on in my life, and I said, listen, fuck sneakers and fuck all this shit. I'm about to get married. I'm about to have a family. Like, fuck everybody. This is stupid. So basically for about three months, I started teasing all my sneakers that I was gonna sell. And I went on eBay, and in a week, people were looking at views. It was kinda like, like YouTube or like right, right. Instagram or whatever. I think Friendster was around then, MySpace was around too, and they were looking at the views, they were looking at how many people were viewing the, the auction. Right. At that time, the auction was crazy and it kept going up and up and up. They're like, yo, this is insane. At the end of the day, you know, I just made right around, just over $2 million on my sneakers. Wow. 
you know, never ever had $100,000 to my name ever. So you ended up selling all your, your back stocks? And everything, years. and it took forever to sell, to, to ship everything and do all that right. stuff, right? So we do it, and the first thing I do is I go buy a Ferrari, and then I drive <laughs> right back to my old neighborhood. Talk about learning your lesson. Yeah. But no, I had, I had it like, I had it, because at that time I was saving, right. like for the first time in my life, but I had- didn't it. have an actual job. No, I was DJing, and then I stopped DJing, because at a certain point, I was coming to the club with an Xbox and playing, and I pre-recorded my mix. And then the, the club owner was like, yo, you're fucking fired. Like, what are you doing? Like, you're not even playing. Like, I was even pre-recording my shout-outs because I knew who would be in the club. So you're so, over here playing Grand Theft Auto, and they're yeah. giving you, like, 600 a night or whatever. So anyway, selling my sneakers and everything else, I had to figure out what I was going to do. At that point, my wife, my fiancé was like, you've turned in such, in such a, she was a huge model at the time, like, right. enormous model. And she had a bunch of billboards. And in a way, I thought I was a shit, but she was actually a very big deal. But she was very humble about it. And she felt like my money was, I was distracted with the money and everything else and what to do. So we traveled and eventually just things didn't work out within that year. Okay. So we broke off the engagement and I was sitting here thinking like, yo, if I don't figure out what I'm going to do, um, you know, I'm going to have to structure. Yeah, I'm going to have, so, so, you know, my cousin, he used to come visit me at Aftermath. And he'd tell Dr. Dre, let me make some aftermath pans, let me make some of this. And he would always tell me, you know, he was trying to hustle. Your cousin was a jeweler. Cousin was a jeweler. My uncle was a jeweler. And um, my uncle was kind of on his way out, but he saw opportunity. He was like, hey, why don't you sell jewelry with us? Okay. And I was like, all right. I spent a lot of my money. On jewelry? Yeah. No, I mean, I spent a lot of my money from the money I made from sneakers. Oh, gotcha. So I was like, what I was going to do was I was about to work for Terry. Terry owned a sneaker store in Fred Siegel called Conveyor. I know Conveyor. Yeah, and I was going to, he owned that store, and he's very smart. This dude is flip buildings. This okay. dude is literally one of the smartest, like, moguls I know. Okay. So You hiring him? So, hey guys, Terry's right yeah. here. He owns an amazing restaurant called Plan Check now. There are a bunch of Plan Checks around, a great burger place. So, he just always had real estate and everything unlocked, and I was like, I gotta figure something out. And I missed the real estate wave a little bit. So, um, your, your cousin. My cousin like, says, Man. listen, we gotta do this. And I talked to an attorney, because everything's gotta be legal. Everything Korean wise is handshakes, and it's real important now. I don't give a fuck how close you are with someone. It could be your sister, contract. it could be your brother. If you do not have a contract, and even with the contract, people are still getting fucked. But if you have no contract, I know a verbal commitment is admissible in court, but it's like, really. It's hard to beat. If it's family, you gotta make sure that you really focus on having your contract. Do you know what I mean? Having that done is, is, is important. If I didn't have that contract, I might have been screwed out of my situation. Now, I'm not speaking bad on my cousin, but I was able to push my uncle out of the business, not, Nothing personal. It was right. a business move. So you, you and your cousin, how did you guys start? Because how did you learn jewelry? Jewelry is not. Well, easy, that's another right? thing too. So I came out. So I know nothing about jewelry except that I know what I like. <laughs> I sold my uncle a piece. I said, "Can you make this?" And it was a Jacob piece. Okay, yeah, Jacob the jeweler, by the way. Is yeah, he was a legend. Jewelry. He was, he was my idol. And my uncle said, Are "You kidding me? I can make this easily." You know right. what I'm saying? I was like, "Are you sure?" Yeah. I was just show me an example, and he was like, 80 percent." I was like, that's gonna be good enough because I got a good mouthpiece. <laughs> now, mind you, I'm entering a total business that's not music, that's not sneakers or anything else. It's a totally different business. And it's controlled by wealthy people. It's not like it's a, you know, yeah, it's we're not talking about costume jewelry. It's a luxury. Yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's a luxury, it's not a necessity. So um, I told them, I said, listen, do you guys have any kind of ownership contracts or any kind of corporation shit? They're like, no, nah, man, their jewelry, <laughs> my uncle's company was called Tiffany Jewelry. Uh, I'm like, how the fuck do you have Tiffany Jewelry? Like, and he had like turquoise boxes that looked like Tiffany cards. So he was basically like. Straight up McDowell's. Catch, yeah. yeah, just <laughs> knocking them off. Amazing. So I came in like an A&R. You added some instruction. I don't want to be in this booth. Let's go to this booth. And you guys were located at the famous. And, and the Slauson Swap Meet, the worst place in the world. You know what I mean? Wow. And, and you guys I said, are still there. Yeah, well. <laughs> Technically, yeah, we started construction at Beverly Center. My new store is opening November 1st or November, first week of November. For all so you jewelry, I will be completely, for all you jewelry buyers. We'll be migrating out of there. And, you know, at a certain point, what it got to was I said, I want to be able to put $1.5 million into this business and I'll match you guys. Okay. And they were like, no, no, you don't have to put any money. We'll give you 50 50. Just the way Korean things work, you know, family, it gets real ugly. Some of the biggest disputes in my, my family are through money. Right. You know? Don't so, ever loan anybody any money, cause you know, or don't, you know, cause you're just not gonna get it back. It's like, <laughs> just, just give so, it to them. So, how did you learn it? Like, did they teach you the ropes? Like, so, what was it? Cause jewelry is very precise, very especially difficult. the level of jewelry you make. So, at a certain point, for about three hours a day, for about ten months, I went and learned 
goldsmithing, casting, fucking diamond setting, everything all the way through. And I knew at that point, for me to even get next to Jacob, you I had, had to, to like, because you have to set a goal at a certain point. You know, if you're a basketball player, you gotta look at LeBron and be like, all right, how do I get to that level? All right, you study certain things. At a certain point, though, if you're not naturally gifted, then you, you know, you, you know, you can't be five two and be like, I want to be LeBron. I mean, it's right. possible, but it's gonna yeah. be fucking so, tough. So, so I mean, we've worked on jewelry together. Yeah. We recently just made Jay Balvin's Murakami piece. Yeah. Um, you know, we've we've done stuff. We've done stuff for Pusha. Yeah. Um, how how was you? You know, you've made stuff for Michael Jackson. How did you start? Did you use your same network of people from the music industry or? What was everything your first everything big was behind the client. scenes. So, a buddy of mine, Mark Sudak, he's a friend of mine from the crew. We just were cool. Somehow, some way, all of us were hustlers. Like all of us could kind of like do deals. Like my boy owned One Oak and Butter and all these places. He was supermodels. You know what I'm saying? All these around. All the dudes in my crew were schemers. Mark was just a smart dude, and he started dating Mariah Carey. Okay. And then he also was executive producer of her album. I hit Mark up. I said, hey, bro, I just started a business, man. Is there any way you can get me to, like, make Mariah Carey a piece, blah, blah, whatever? And he was like, yeah, come on, man, I got you. That was one. That was the first one. Number two, the clips, Pusha and, and, um, and Malice. Which piece did you do? Did you do the I clips? I did the clips. The I did clips the official logo? clips piece, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, I just started building up things. Um, go to Michael Jackson. He was managed by a guy named Tomei Tomei. Tomei Tomei is like scary Sopranos type dude. Like I don't really want to say too much about it, but, but he, he basically bankrolled, he bought, he... Uh, yeah, let's not get tied up, man. Yeah. So this guy so was... He, so he bought Michael Jackson's dad and kidnapped. became his manager. Right. And, um, you know, so uh, I was like, hey, bro, um, I want to make Michael Jackson a piece. Okay. And he goes, Michael loves jewelry. And I was like, bro, all I need is an introduction. And he goes, yeah, I mean, Michael at that point, like any enormous celebrity, they're not just to go to anybody. It has to be right. someone they trust. Right, of course. So he said, oh, this guy's doing pieces for like some hip hop people, blah, blah, whatever. And I was like, no, don't say that. Don't say that. Like, you know, try to make it like I'm making cool jewelry. Yeah. <laughs> you wanted the good, the top level yeah. intro, right? So, you know, I got to take my glasses off for this because I lied to him. You lied to like, Michael Jackson? Yeah, I was like, yo, man, I could do anything you want. Blah. By the way, when I first met him, it was crazy because we met at a, at a cafe in Brentwood. And um, this is fucking Mike, dog. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm starstruck. Star Did nobody. he have the glove on? No. <laughs> so he had a sweatsuit on. And we're sitting there. With the buttons. And it's like, here, here, and here's Mike. Mike is sitting where that camera is, okay. and he won't speak to me. He's speaking to his manager to tell me. He said, like, can you tell him that I want blue? And I was like. He didn't say it like that, though. He said, can you yeah. tell him that? But I was really bummed out. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was bummed out. I was like, wow, dude. You didn't want to talk to And me. then I thought about it, and I really put it in perspective. I said, if there's fucking anybody who could be fucking crazy or be weird. It's Michael Jackson. It's got to be him, of course. So what did you make of him? So I accepted it. First thing we did was a brooch. It was this Michael Jackson logo with a unicorn and red rubies, canary diamonds, all sort of stuff. And I made it and it wasn't, he didn't like it. And the crazy thing is I was already into it for 30 grand. He's like, I don't care, I'm not paying you, I don't want it. And I was like, yo, you gotta be fucking Jesus. kidding me. So we fixed it, we finally made it, it was cool. And he goes, all right, I want to get this belt buckle and blah, blah, whatever. And so he, he wanted, wasn't making like traditional jewelry. No, he, he was making he was belts all kinds of brooches. Brooches, brooches bel uh, belt buckles. He made, um, I did a bandana and I was like, yo, you do realize if we stitch, my mom was a dress contractor. Right. She was retired and I was like, hey mom, is there a way we could do this? And she goes, yeah, the rhinestones. I was like, no, with real diamonds. And she's like, why would you want to do that? And you're gonna just- It's Michael like, Jackson, It's mom. Michael Jackson. So we did like some bandanas and stuff. We done a so, bunch of stuff. So I'm, I mean, again, the jewelry is what you're so known for. You make some of the biggest, best pieces in, in, in the industry. So many artists have worked for you, for Drake, Mariah Carey, like you said, every artist. But you actually turned down, turned down a lot of people. Yeah. Um, one of the things that stood out to me, and and you know that got you as a cultural icon to me, was some of the some of your best pieces went to the legendary Jonas. Oh yeah, man. You know, um, this is one of your one of your closest friends. Um, you know, one of the hardest losses that Streetwear has ever had to take. Um, Jonas from LRG, who I think uh, top five jewelry of all time. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you and Jonas' relationship transitioned into, I know this can take us all day, but give me a concise version of how you guys transitioned into doing stuff for LRG, you working with uh, you know, Diamond, and that kind of was your foyer into streetwear, because Jonas was jewelry king. I mean, Jonas was jewelry king. I met him at the Sound Bombing 3 like, mixtape thing, and I saw this little Asian dude, and you know, with Asian people, we have competition. People think that everyone, but like Asians hate on each other, but we stick together, but there's like, if you get to a certain level where like, some dude pulls up in a Ferrari, 
They're like, man, that shit's a 2014, my shit's a 2017, man, come on. You know, we low-key hate each other. Yeah. So he had like a chain he had got made, and I seen it, and I met him, and I was like, yo, what's good? I seen him, you know, but I was like, that chain's cool, that shit kind of garbage, though, I'll make you a better one. And he was like, how the fuck you Mine, this guy's rich, he's like, like how you, you know, got I'm to? like, yeah, you come to my, to my shoot, but we end up building a relationship, and I start realizing how much a visionary this dude was, and how much he was Nego, and how much he was just so, I mean, this dude really had the urban streetwear gap of the world. He really brought the next Ralph Lauren, like, you know, to the hood, right. to the streets. Anyways, we started making some amazing jewelry. Um, he makes the Forbes list. I'm the real Forbes, you know what I'm saying? He yeah. was doing his thing, and, um, you know, he's partying out of control. He had everything else in order except the personal life, and, um, you know. And you guys were, like, really out here. I mean, if you guys remember this, this era of streetwear, you know, I see a lot of young faces in the Yeah, crowd, no, we were acting like, retarded. This you know? era of streetwear was really the beginning when LR, brands like LRG, um, you know, 10 deep, the hundreds, these guys were all kind of coming up at the we time. We took out Bape at the time. That's how big we were. Yeah. We took out Bape. We took Bathing Ape. We don't want to wear Bathing Ape anymore. They were in LRG. So LRG also broke a lot of artists. Like Kanye was in a, his first ad in the LRG ad. Wale was in a LRG ad. Drake. All these, I put Drake in there. Right. So all these LRG ads kind of pushed, pushed fashion and Jonas was... Stunned to the max. Yeah. I mean, he, the he, max. He, was, he was a legend. And, you know, just um, at a certain point, you know, uh, he calculated how much he had to make become a billionaire. He and knew I how said, much he had to make a yeah. game type. And I was like, yo, bro, like, fuck this, man. Let's live life. Right. And he goes, we're living. And I'm like, no, nah, man, you're stressing about becoming a billionaire when you're missing out on all the fucking other shit. Like, right. you have a kid. I'm, that's my dream to have a kid, you know? Like, right. I say this today, if I didn't have children, I probably wouldn't be as successful as I am right now because right. I'm so stressed out about how much money I gotta make to make sure that they're okay right. until they're at least, I'm gonna give them to at least 20. After 20, if they can't make money after that, then too fucking bad, man, you know? <laughs> so, so, all right, let's, uh, so LRG was your first foyer into the streetwear stuff at your own? LRG was my first professionally, like, went into it. And then it got a little corporate. I hope nobody from LRG takes it personal because I know that some of the guys are here. They just sold recently. But um, me and Joe and Steph had a falling out. It's just that he had now corporate people coming in trying to direct what I should do. And I was like a brand ambassador, like a mascot to the brand. And I wasn't really getting paid like a crazy amount of money. Right. It was just something I was fucking with. Right. I decided I had learned exactly what I liked, what I thought should be on shirts because there's a million different clothing companies now. And um, at that point, the dude offered me $1,500 a month. Right. And I was like, do you guys know what you guys are paying me now? Because I think you got, and, and it was just, I guess he was trying to like, but it was disrespectful. Right. So I kindly, respectfully declined. And then you started and doing I, so and much walked, stuff. And I walked away and I said, listen, I told Nick Diamond to say, hey, bro, we need to fucking figure something out with Diamond because you've been sitting at this two to $5 million mark a year at retail. I think we could take this to another level. I can't take all the responsibility or even a lot of it. There's this dude named Brock that worked for Diamond. You guys know Brock? He's now uh, Kendrick Lamar's A&R. He's very, very big and influential in the music and fashion industry. He was a very, very big part of why Diamond blew up as well. Obviously, Nick had a great brand. and You know, the skateboarding thing became big. Lil Wayne was skateboarding and we decided to transition. How do we get this in there? Rick Ross did a small collaboration and Rick Ross started wearing it in the videos. Right. People just started coming in. I started coming in. I'm good at like when I start seeing a link on momentum, I'm gonna fucking push. Bitch, everyone push. You know, push. So you started there. doing collabs, right? Started doing started collabs, doing started doing collab. diamond and stuff and everything, and we just started killing it. You know, we we jumped from five mil. The next year we did twenty one mil. The next year we did like sixty. The next year we did a hundred, and it was like we just kept. Dog, it was insane. In that same token, you also did your own shoe. I did my own shoe, and then I also had my my company IF and Co. And we're co-branded because think about it, Diamond Supply Co. Diamonds. I'm a jeweler. Perfect. So it made sense. I was doing these in stores and I'd have five, six hundred people meet up at the stores in Arizona and like fucking Sacramento or whatever. And you know, to this day, everything I've done in my life, Nick Diamond's the only person that ever, he wrote me the biggest checks I ever had in my entire life. He gifted me a Ferrari after my second collab. Wow. He was like, boom. And I was like, did you lease this? He was like, dog, the pink slip. And going back, when I was DJing at some places, I remember people, like, they have, to have, have dress codes at nightclubs. Right. Like, you know, where I was like, yo, I don't, I mean, I wear a suit now and it's cool. Yeah. But I felt corny being that way. Right. You know, going into this, it all coincides with each other. You know, JCK is the biggest jewelry convention on the earth. They're talking about there's maybe a billion, over a billion dollars in jewelry in the upstairs luxury division. Right. These are like, these are people that look at me like, right. you came out here. You went completely against the odds of people that go to Cartier or Harry Winston or Van Cleef, 
and you started this own lane, you did your own thing by your own rules, you started this custom jewelry thing, you kept it mostly Korean, you kept it with your heritage, you kept it true, and you did it wearing a t-shirt and like skinny jeans. Wow, that's, that's and so I went upstairs and grabbed my, my, my shit and went back so, down with chains on, you know. So, um, you know, we, we've gone through your music industry, your background, the jewelry, the fashion, you know, some of your new ventures now. Have you guys been by the, by the BVS pens? You're on the BVS pens. Give, give me a quick uh, info about what I'm that is. I'm saying, please wrap it up. <laughs> um, real quick, I just basically now, with seeing my kids and seeing what tuition costs and certain things, it's like, you know, I wish, my wife is really chill. She doesn't post bags or anything online, she's just really chill. So like when I see this, I'm like, all right, listen, I have a certain lifestyle I gotta maintain just for my own self. Other than that, I'm pretty chill, right? right? But mortgage, this shit, it all adds up. Right. And before, and it's like people are like, oh man, you don't have to say this shit. I, I just do so people can kind of understand that I lived in a place that was fucking $300 a month for rent. Right. Do you know what I mean? To right. where I'm at now. Before I could even, before my sons could have their chicken nuggets, before anything, I have to make $47,000 a month to break my bills. Wow. Okay? And I do that every month. I have to have a certain amount of money to do that. And, you know, that stresses me the fuck out. So I put <laughs> cushions out there. Myself, right. I have an accountant, but my accountant doesn't keep my numbers. My numbers are kept in front of me. Even if it's like, all right, I have $1,362 in my pocket on uh, July 15th. Right. On the 17th, I see where my pocket was at that time, where it came from. I'm updating all the time, so I'm always just cautious of it. So, with that said, I'm always worrying about just their future. Right. I saw an opportunity in cannabis. I saw that Prop 65 was going up. I saw that we're about to be a recreation state. Right. I saw what other states were doing. I saw where money was going, and I just saw this early. Even though people were making money on the streets with weed, it's different because it's just legal. Of course. I developed a company called VVS Pens. We're a cannabis pen company. I saw a buddy of mine had a pen, and I said, hey, listen, uh, what do you get it manufactured? Instead of being a backstabber and being a piece of shit, I said, for once, would you want to produce my pen? Do you know what I mean? And if you do, I'd make you an equal partner right. if you could just produce my pens. Right. And as things went, we started developing, why can't we use the same cannabis oil? Because the thickness, we just, basically, I'm a detailed person from so doing perfected everything. perfected it. Perfected it. But I wasn't making this for guys who were like 18 years old, going to college, living in a dorm, being like, oh man, I'm struggling, I need some weed. This was more for like the upper Taste echelon. Level, right. Yeah, the, the classy, you know, I made a yellow gold pen, a rose gold pen. It looks classy, it looks like, right. like makeup, it's discreet. So Some people don't accept weed still, they think it's a drug, they don't know if it's medicine. So this is one of like your newest ventures. One of my newest ventures, and it took a year to develop this pen, and now we have the pen and I'm moving approximately $3 million of pens a month. Wow, that's crazy. You know what I mean? And it's, and it's all legit. I'm not trying, like, anyone has a problem with it, bring it back, I give you your money back. It's not, there's no gimmick. Right. There's, that's one thing. People say, like, oh, man, Ben's a fraud, or oh, Ben's fronting, or Ben's renting cars. Ben, <laughs> man, bro, I'm 44, you know what I mean? I've been in the man. game for a minute. I've been through every other uh, Friendster, MySpace, Facebook. Like, <laughs> someone would have been out of me, like, with real hardcore, ever. you know, right. it's, it's just, I just keep it pushing, and I don't listen to anybody. Sometimes people focus too much on anything. Man, if you have any kind, like you can have a heart, but if you're too sensitive to haters and people telling you what to do, at a certain point, you ask five people, what should I do? And they all have an opinion. Right. And it's like, you could take a little bit of that, but if ideally, you can't just take charge and figure out what the fuck you wanna right. do, you're gonna do it. And I knew this was gonna be a lucrative business for me, and it's doing well, and we're gonna keep evolving and keep evolving into other things. So, um, you know, just to wrap it up here, you, yeah. you get a lot of, there's a lot of hate for you in yeah. the social media world, but we know that's not a real world. We know you're a beacon of the culture. A lot of people respect you. Um, you know, you've done so much. You inspire me, you inspire a bunch of other people. If there's one thing, one piece of advice that you can give everybody in this room, as far as going through adversity, wanting to do multiple things that you really love as a passion, what would be that? What that? What would that advice be to get to that? Look, to get to where you are, that one piece that just kind of resonated with you always, and you kept on. What would that be? Man, dude. See, you know what? We're supposed to prepare for all this shit. He decided to hit me with the organic questions, and like, <laughs> and it fucked me up. So I had no idea. Um, Truly, but, it, but it's gonna be the best answer because I know it comes from your heart. So no, I mean, there's really no like. Some people are always like, you should write a book. You do something. That, that's not me. I'm not a multi-level. I'm not. But I know that there's something that Tony you just Robbins. stood. You stood true to, and what was that? You know, what was that one thing that you just stood true to? Man, you know, I think. I mean, one, it was just something like, listen, if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna be the best at it. So. People are looking at like, okay, well, listen, I want to be a billionaire. Well, that's not everyone's goals. Do you know what I'm saying? I look at it like in everything I did, I want to be the best at that, that and that, that. So let's say, for instance, I look at like, 
I was the first Asian American in my entire university's history to play ball. Right. I wanted to at least hit that goal. Then I opened that, I opened a lane now for Koreans or Chinese or Vietnamese or anyone that's Asian to play ball or have a chance right. before Jeremy Lin was playing in the, in the league or whatever. And I said, listen, I always took it as, I worked at Subway, I worked at Burger King, you know, I worked at fucking uh, Warehouse Records, you know, whatever. Right. I'm saying, if you're going to take a job and you're going to show up to work, you might as well do your job. Like, why the fuck are you going to go to work if you're going to do your job? If right. you hate it or not, okay? If you're going to be a trash man, if I was going to become a trash man in sanitation, I'm going to be the best fuck. I'm going to be the president of all sanitation <laughs> tra trash men. Yeah, the serious, the streets. I want to be the best at it. Right. And you got to do research. You got to have market. You got to have gimmick. And you obviously, you know, you have to have some kind of an angle. So with everything I've done, whether it be music, you know, with DJ, I wasn't the best DJ in the world. But I knew where I could get in, where I can freak it. I knew how to get people excited. Right. You know, maybe that's something that not everyone has, but everyone can have drive. I don't care how, a lot of people are quiet, some people are confrontational. I see people talk shit all the time, like, man, I'll fuck this dude up. And then I meet him in person, he's like, I was like, yo, why'd you let that guy talk to you like that? He's like, oh, no, man, you know, people are just not, people have to just let go of your fears, man, let go of any of the sensitivity, and you gotta take a chance, because at a certain point, you're gonna be 50, and what the fuck are you gonna do? You're gonna be working out, I'm not, I'm not dissing anybody who works at McDonald's, but it's like, yo, man, at a certain point, you gotta try to evolve every year, just a little bit. Right. If I could be better today than I was yesterday, could. Tomorrow, I'm trying to be better than I was today. Right. Every day, I'm trying to grow somehow, some way. And with that said, I'm always trying to be the best at what I do. So if he works at you know, H&M, at a certain point, and it's possible, he could be a salesperson. Why can't he be the vice president of the company in three years, of the corporation? Right. There's some way to get in, you just have to figure out where your lane is, where your strengths are, you know, where, you know, if you have attributes, man, fucking embrace those, right. you know, and take them. I just, I always felt like I got to be the best at what I do. So if I want to do the pen, I want to have the best pens. All right, I fucked up here. All right, let's make it better. Right. And you just got to just, and you got to admit your faults. So and that's you, just, so you're saying basically whatever it is that you do, try to do it to the max. But beyond that, you know what I mean? Like, don't go, why would you go about things halfway? You know what I mean? Or half ass or anything. If you're going to invest in something like, you know, right. someone's like, Hey man, uh, uh, I'm going to start a, a, a sneaker store. Right. Like, you don't know shit about sneakers. Why the fuck would you start a sneaker store? Right. Do you know? I'm just saying in general, if there's one idea I could give to somebody, it's like, if you're going to go, if you're going to come to work, you're going to show up, do your show job, up. man. Right. And not just show up, man. Show out. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, why go out there? Like, it's it just, there's so many players in the NBA. I look at this. This is my perfect example. Think of all these guys. They're the best guys that were in the high school, best guys in college. Then they made the pros, and some guys don't shine, some do. Right. All it takes is one person to hit that shot. All it took was Dwayne Wade was at a three, you know, Division three college. You just get that chance. All of these guys have it in them to go do it. Sometimes there's politics holding you back. All right, figure out what that is. Right. That's a little different, I know, but I'm saying in general, everyone has that. They're, they're all talented. Right. Everyone in this room has talent. Everyone in this room has chance to make money. It's not about money always. You know, I'm comfortable. I'm all right. I'm not trying to be a billionaire. Right. I just want to make sure that my family can eat and we're good. So really, at the end of the day, if you become too greedy, it's just going to bite you in the ass. So you, know? you guys got it straight from Ben Baller. Let's <laughs> give him a round of applause.